Goes back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turk, thank you for being here today. Uh, as uh, you probably know, my home state of Rhode Island is a leader in clean energy. Uh, we're home to our nation's first ever commercial offshore wind farm. Thanks to five turbines, uh, we produce enough electricity each year to power approximately 17,000 homes. This clean energy revolution is part and parcel of how we meet our energy needs, fight the climate crisis, and support good paying jobs. However, if you'll excuse the pun, development of offshore wind faces unique headwinds. Uh, there's an underdeveloped domestic supply chain, long permitting timelines, and difficulty integrating into the existing grid. If we're to meet President Biden's goal of deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030, and Rhode Island's goal of committing to 100% renewable energy by 2030, we must move quickly. The Wind Energy Technologies Office is key to wind energy research, development, demonstration, and deployment activities. Mr. Turk, the President's fiscal year 2025 budget request included a $62 million funding increase for the Wind Energy Technologies Office. Please describe how increased funding will support deploying 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. Well, it's a phenomenal office led by Jocelyn, who's the head of that office, but um, there's such an opportunity for us in offshore wind. I don't need to tell you that, and thank you for Rhode Island's leadership on that front. Um, we are poised to have offshore wind be such a big, big part, not just on the East Coast, but we're working on the West Coast uh, as well. Uh, unfortunately, we have run into, to use your pun, uh, some extraordinary headwinds. Uh, it's supply chains, it's a number of the things you mentioned. It's also interest rates, which having our particular impact on off, uh, offshore wind. So we're trying to use all the tools that we've got in our tool belt, including our phenomenal wind technology office, but we're also working with the IRS on the tax incentive piece of it and making sure the tax incentive uh, is fit for purpose for offshore wind in particular. Uh, we've put out some additional information on energy communities and other kinds of things that we hope will help uh, offshore wind developers make the numbers uh, work and the numbers add up. Our loan program is literally talking to every single offshore wind developer to see if that's a useful tool, again, to reduce the cost of capital and to get those projects out there uh, and to build from that success. So we're leaning in on all parts of offshore wind. It is a particularly uh, uh, I think the headwinds are abating a bit, if I can continue that metaphor, but we need to get beyond uh, those challenges and get that offshore wind out there in the real world and build up those supply chains and build up those jobs. There's a huge amount of jobs if we build up that supply chain as well, as you very well know. Yeah. Well, in Rhode Island, we've got lots of leadership, especially partnerships uh, with labor and, and, and unions to get that workforce we need. And of course, uh, we know that, uh, but for the IRA, we would not be able to catalyze uh, some of the progress we've made even further. I did want to talk a little bit uh, and hear from you on transmission access. Right. Of course, uh, we know that critical to achieving our offshore wind deployment goals is making sure that we have adequate and affordable transmission access. And so earlier this year, uh, your department uh, released the Atlantic Offshore Wind uh, Transmission Study and the Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Action Plan that recommend the next steps to connect offshore wind projects to the grid along the Atlantic coast. Um, Mr. Turk, can you share a little bit about the challenges uh, that the department faces in supporting the interregional transmission planning needed to connect offshore wind projects to the grid, and really, what can we in Congress do to help? Yeah, so uh, uh, we've got transmission challenges, not just for offshore wind and mm -hmm. connecting offshore wind to the grid, uh, but across our country. It takes way too long to permit offshore wind, or sorry, permit transmission. Uh, and we need to reduce those times. So uh, we're undertaking a whole slew of efforts, um, including doing what we can using an old law, old, I guess, by relative terms from 2005. Uh, CITAP is the acronym of this transmission permitting expediting authority that we're using with a two-year shot clock. So it's not taking us 15, 16, 17 years to actually get transmission in our country, including for offshore wind. It's a two-year shot clock under that uh, effort that we're implementing with uh, others in the interagency on that front. Uh, there are some financial incentives. We are using our loan program to help on transmission build out, uh, but frankly, there's more tools we could use from Congress to help on transmission as well. This is a big, big deal, as you rightfully know, and eager to follow up with you and your staff and the chair and ranking member on 
uh, any technical assistance we could do in terms of uh, informing what Congress could further do on this effort. Well, I look forward to those conversations. Uh, we need to move. We need to move fast. And uh, I'm a partner to you on that effort. With that, I yield back. Thank Gentleman's you. Gentlemen's time is yielded.